Hey peeps, we are back. We're talking love after lockup, season three, episode 39. All right, let's get into it. So the show starts off with Rachel and Doug. You know, the only thing I can say about Doug is he is extremely immature. Um, just watching them on this episode, it reminded me that he has been in jail for such a long time. When he entered prison, he was 17 years old and him and his son's mother, he said they had little Dougie when they were both 15. And I just don't think either one of them were ready. Um, I just don't think he is prepared to be someone's father. And he's definitely not prepared to be someone's husband. Um, he is not anyone's head of the household. His maturity level is just not there. I think in his mind, he thinks that he can be a father and a husband and hold down and support a household. But I agree with Rachel's mom. He knows exactly where his bread is buttered. And I think that he is about to use Rachel until she is used up completely. And she's sitting back smiling and laughing and thinking that life is so great. Oh my gosh, he's six foot five. He's so tall. He's handsome. He likes baloney and the other three B's. And we're about to be a family. I'm going to get pregnant. And girl, you need to actually run. Okay, better yet, you need to put him out and put on a restraining order. I mean, I'm sorry. My only concern in their relationship is little Dougie. That little boy deserves love. He deserves patience, understanding, and stability. He needs to have a healthy environment. And I think that his environment with Rachel, without Big Doug and the mama, was probably the best and safest and most loving environment that that little boy has ever been in. And I am hoping so much that Doug Sr. can act as if he's got a little bit of sense. You have got to grow up and grow up quick. For this little Dougie's sake. Came and got me and we uh, went to the hotel room. Tried to give you a grandbaby. Now, personally, I thought that was a little too much. You know, that woman doesn't want to hear about that. She absolutely does not want you with her daughter, period. And for you to tell her about the sex is ridiculous. And her asking him about trade school and all that stuff, girl, please. He is not trying to find a job. The only reason he will look for a job is because it's going to be a part of his pro role. Otherwise, he would just lay up in the house drinking non-alcoholic beer for now because you know that's turning into alcoholic beer here shortly, and eating bologna sandwiches that he's making in the microwave. Buddy, you are no longer in prison. Get out a pan and fry it up there. I mean, microwave bologna. That's not me. Anyway, moving on. Now, when him and little Dougie see each other for the first time, I did get a tad bit emotional. So when they invite her mother out to dinner with them and she says, no, thank you. You know, I think the three of you need to spend time together and this will give you and little Dougie a chance to get to know each other again. Well, when little Dougie makes the comment that they don't really know each other, Doug gets a little bit of an attitude, but that is the truth. You went to jail when he was one. He don't know you. I mean, besides prison phone calls and maybe a visit or two here and there, he doesn't know you, buddy, and you don't know him. And what happened is he got his little feelings hurt when he makes this comment, I'm not one of those girls you talk to. And little Dougie says, I only talk to one girl. I'm not like you having 10 girlfriends in three years. I said, all right, <laughs> one of them has to be smart. And clearly it's little Dougie. And I'm looking at Rachel with the look on her face. And I said, I hope she didn't think that she was the only woman that reached out to him from his prison pen pal site. I am absolutely positive that there was other phone calls and other visits from different women. Girl, you better cut the crap. Rachel seems very happy 
Um, I'll walk outside. But my gut made me sick from the minute I met him. He knows where his bread and butter is at. So what do you think of Doug? Um, he really should be a little more humbler. He's not in prison anymore. Honey, I'm team little Dougie. This woman has set herself up for a failure. She really has. They have definitely got to put little Dougie first. He has had enough pain in his short little life. You gonna start talking to me with a little respect? Huh? No. No? Uh -huh. You're gonna have to change your style up, dude. Dougie gets away with murder, Rachel. I'm just coming home and I'm trying to give him a break of a transitional period. I'm letting him be in a kid, but Dougie's gonna have to know that I'm, I'm the rule maker here. And if he's going to be my rule breaker, there's going to be consequences behind it. Now, honey, listen, Doug has no idea how to parent. And he thinks that he's going to be able to come in and use brute force against little Dougie. And that's not okay. You can tell that his parenting style and Rachel's parenting style does not match. Rachel really does need to be paying attention. You are somewhere saying that you want to have a baby with this guy. He's a complete idiot. Anyway, good luck to little Dougie. Dante and Nicole. Honey, listen, I don't care about this man. <laughs> this man is a complete idiot. I mean, serious. He says in a previous episode that since he's been dating her, he's spent anywhere from twenty to twenty-four thousand dollars on this woman. You are being used. How many people have to tell you that? Your best friend told you on the first episode. Your mama told you. Your little brother told you. I've been saying it. I know you can't hear me, buddy, but still. I have zero sympathy for Dante when she takes him for everything he's got. Zero sympathy. Now listen, he takes her to the hair salon. She's somewhere getting cute because you know, she she got to see her ex-boyfriend Zach in a couple days. You know, she had set that up on the last episode. She's with one of her jailhouse friends at the beauty salon. And she's pretty much telling everybody at beauty salon. You know, he's bought me X, Y, and Z. He gave me money. He got me Michael Kors watches. He's paying for this hair to be done. You know, he has no idea that, you know, she's also into women. I said, hey, Lindsay, 2.0. I mean, shoot, she's getting more out of Deante or Dante or whatever. She's getting more out of him than Lindsay got out of Scott. Listen, it turns out she's got this ex-girlfriend that she still cares about, that she was with in the prison, and they're having a party, and he, she wants to invite this girl to the party while she's there getting her extensions because she wants to look like a Barbie. You missed it. You don't. Anyway, he's out somewhere buying her a dress. Such an idiot. You know, they're back at his apartment, and he wants her to put on some lingerie. She puts it on, but then she lets him know that he's not getting the sex. She gives him a little whack lap dance and he wants to touch and she says there's no touching. She lets him know that there will be no sex, no sex, until she gets a boob job that he needs to pay for. Listen here, listen here. Buddy, buddy, you brought all this on yourself. This is called ridiculous. You are doing too much and I can't take it. You have wrecked my nerves. You are allowing this woman to walk all over you and treat you like crap. There is no way this woman has any feelings for you and she does not want to be touched by you or have the sex. She is going to get all cute and fabulous with your money and, and give all the sex to Zach and that girl that she's inviting to the party, okay? Dante's out buying me a new dress right now. Is he? He bought me a bunch of gifts, too. He bought me two Michael Kors watches, three pairs of Jordans. <laughs> Barbie does Barbie not care. has had maintenance. <laughs> so Dante was sending Nicole lots of money while she was in prison. Hey, what do you think he wants in return? And I know what he wants in return, <laughs> but he's not going to get it. Need to run. Don't walk. Run. Go to your house and never let her over again. I'm just saying. Courtney and Josh. So listen, Josh was raised by his grandma. His mom had some sort of drug addiction, so his grandmother stepped up to the plate, like a lot of grandmas out here, and took responsibility for him and raised him. Now, he's in jail for a crime that he, he committed, okay? And he is angry and bitter. And he sends this angry letter to his grandmother telling her how 
much she let him down and he doesn't love her anymore and just outright ridiculous and disrespectful to this woman who has raised him and loved him from day one. She says that she shared custody with his father until he was about five and she found out that his father was feeding him beer when he had his visitation. So she took him back from his dad. This woman, she raised her children. She didn't have to raise Josh, but she took him because she loved him and it was her grandson. And that's what a lot of grandmas do. You know what I mean? Even though they've already raised their kids. So he's sitting at the house with his wife, Courtney, which I like her. Josh, not so much, not yet. Anyway, he's telling Courtney how sad he is that he hasn't spoken to his mom, which is what he calls his grandma, and she calls her Mama Rose. Anyway, he wants to apologize, so he gives her a call and asks her if she can come over. And you could tell that one, she was happy to hear from him, but she wasn't going to give an inch. She really wasn't because he heard her. He heard her. And you could tell she was hurt, but she was also happy that he was out of jail. Well, he does go to see her and he gives her this heartfelt apology and she accepts his apology. She's just wishing and hoping and praying for the best. She knows that he's got this amazing uh, new wife and she's been supportive to him. She's been there for him. She has given him thousands of dollars. Now she's given him a home and all these new dogs and she wants him to do right by her. He tells her that he would like to plan a little wedding for her so that they can actually have a real wedding because they did that double proxy thing. And let me tell you, listen, they don't need to remarry because this relationship is not going to work. But I understand that he wants to give her a real wedding. That double proxy thing, that's, that's just ridiculous. Who wants to do that? Anyway, good luck, people. Good luck. I don't see this relationship working out at all, but good luck. Now this Anissa and Jeff, honey, let me see. Let me tell you, let me tell you, this is about to be quick because this woman is out of her daggone mind. So she's got her friend Kyle over. Kyle who's over way too much. Kyle who is there every day. Kyle who is really a good dude, but buddy, Kyle, <laughs> let it go. Anyway, Kyle is there and he's helping her put on her lashes. I said, what the lashes? Okay, thank you, Kyle. Anyway, he's a real, he's a real good friend. So. He rides with her to go pick up Jeff and he's a little hesitant. He says, is he really gonna show up? Because he's still thinking that Jeff might not be legit. And as I said, the last video, Jeff is legit. He's a real person and he's gonna show up because he's gonna need that check from the Love After Lockup people. If those Love After Lockup people were not following them and watching them, if they were not on this show, Jeff would not show up. He would be the amazing Houdini. And honey, he would disappear, disappear, let me tell you. Anyway, he shows up and he doesn't look a thing like those photos, not a thing. No, ma'am, he was in the prison and put on a little COVID weight. Either that's or he stopped taking his drugs and now he's gained a little weight. He's lost a few teeth. Um, there's a lot going on with him. However, he is not a fan of Kyle. Every time he tried to get a word in edgewise with Anissa, Kyle just jumped in. It was as if they were playing the double dutch. And Kyle says, uh-uh, I'm going to get in here and jump until I can't no more. Kyle was answering all the questions and Jeff was not happy. They dropped Jeff off at the halfway house and he didn't even want to shake or say goodbye to Kyle. He is not there for it. And I think that he is going to try to break up Anissa's relationship with Kyle because if Kyle is around as much as he currently is around, Kyle is always going to peep his game and he's always going to be there for Anissa's protection. And I don't think Jeff likes that because I think Jeff's intentions are to suck this woman dry and then bounce or go back to jail. Either way, this relationship is not going to work. Moving on, Stan and Lisa. Stan has not changed my opinion in him at all. I think he is an absolute creep. He is a creep, he is creepy, he is nasty, and he is so unsupportive, just an emotional mess. Oh, I don't know how his wife stayed with him in the first place all those years. We find out that Lisa is sleeping in her own room because Stan has night terrors. I said, oh my God, you are gross and creepy and you have night terrors? That's even more creepy if you ask me. I cannot 
be around anybody with the night terrors. I mean, seriously, you would scare the crap out of me on a regular basis that I'm already creeped out by you, Stan. Anyway, Lisa is really standoffish and Stan is upset because all he wants to do is to get down in that nasty basement with that straight jacket and have a little bit of the sex. Okay, but Lisa's not here for it. After his behavior on that car ride home, she's not ready to just bust it open for Stan. Are you kidding me? Your behavior was ridiculous. So he is just absolutely ticked off because she is not there for him. He wants her undivided attention. 100% of her, forget your family, forget your friends. And that is a red flag. Anytime you get into a relationship and the person you're in a relationship with does not want you to be around your family and friends, tells me that that person is aggressive and possessive and controlling and no, okay, we are done. That's all I'm saying. If they don't want you around your family and friends, there's a reason for it. Run, okay, by relationship, I'ma find me a man who wants to be inclusive in my family and friends. I was thinking that you'd say, you know, maybe he could come over here until you try to figure it out, but you haven't even said that, so. I think you need to figure it out and then maybe we'll discuss coming here. I didn't understand that. Is she asking Stan if her son can come over so they can talk? Or is she asking Stan if her son can move in? Because if she was asking if he could come over so they could communicate, then Stan is absolutely wrong for saying no. But if he, but if she was asking him if her son could move in, then I'm team Stan, no ma'am. Your son cannot move in here, I hardly know you. Your son can't move in here either. But if he wants to come over and stay for a few days or talk this out with you, absolutely. Come on over, Stan is ridiculous. You have children. I don't know how old your kids are, but I'm assuming that they're, you know, in their 20s, 30s, or 40s. Stan, you're being ridiculous. This woman is a mom, even if she's not the best. Stan wants me to leave my past behind and wants me to give all my family up, my kids, uh, their problems, to, to come in his perfect little world and be perfect. And that's not the case. That's never going to be the case. He'll go before they do. Now... Team Lisa again. Whoever would have thought I would be Team Lisa. But anyway, yeah, Team Lisa here. You are going to go. You buy Stan. You are definitely going to go before my kids do. I am never. Let me repeat that. Never in my life ever going to put a man, a woman, children, anybody in front of mine. My child is everything, and he is absolutely going to come first. And if a man does not understand it or respect that, please find you a deadbeat woman somewhere else because you in the wrong place. I'm not the one for you. I understand what she's saying. Her son called her crying feeling alone, desperate, and sad. There is nowhere else that I would rather be than with my son, loving on him and explaining to him how much his mother loves him and he's not alone. And that's what she wants to do. And Stan just wants to get down in the basement and get nasty. Stan, you are gross. I know that you're, you know, feeling some type of way after what I said. That's true, but uh, I don't know what else to tell you. 22 year old, I thought he'd be man enough to work on his own. I, well, obviously, I don't know. I don't know how he's feeling. I want to try to figure it out. Okay, well, go. I, I can guarantee, though, if you're... I think you need to go and do it, then. I'm going to. Go. This. I can guarantee you, you wouldn't act like this if it was your child. I raised my children right. You didn't. You're a piece of... You're a piece... You know yeah, what? You can't admit the truth, can you? No, he's out of his mind. Clearly, it does not matter if her child was seven or 67. He is still her child. As a parent, our children are always gonna be babies in our head. They are always gonna be our tiny baby, no matter how old they are. And we are always gonna run to their side. We're always gonna try to be there for them, especially if we know that they need us. And this is something that's emotional. You know, this is ridiculous and Stan is disgusting. I'm glad that she got her stuff and left. I really am. Um, Stan seems to be an extremely selfish man. Um, I don't see anything kind or good about Stan. He's just reminding me of Mr. Burns from The Simpson in the face and just rude. And oh my gosh, now he has made me rude. I never talk about people. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm over it, Stan. Anyway. 
Until next time, bye.